The impacts of climate change are everywhere to be seen, but no more acutely so than in small islands and country. Weather extremes from rainy to dry, bushfires, frequent and more intense cyclones and hurricanes, accelerated sea level rise and the disruption of whole ecosystems, including large marine ecosystems in our oceans, are changing the way we live and the prospects for our children's future. There's been a resounding call for leaders the world over to take bold steps to curb greenhouse gas emissions, to avoid worst case scenarios that now can best be compared to the magnitude of events as COVID-19. Yet, if those aggressive steps are taken, there is already warming locked into our present climate and future climate. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its special report on 1.5 projects that even stabilizing temperatures at 1.5 will have disproportionate impacts, especially for disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. The costs, whether social or economic, of the adaptation challenge are inevitable. Our ability to meet them is not definitive, but will be consequential in the near and medium term. Presenting their perspectives on what is at stake, we have joining us today, Tina Sigi, the Climate Envoy of the Republic of Marshall Islands, Mr. Taranaki Tanalu, the Director of Multilateral Affairs of the Kiribati Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Tiara Delani, a researcher who is from the Kwandamuka people of Minjeraba, North Stadberg Island. Following these perspectives, we will look at the responses to the implementation challenges, specifically the adaptation finance gap, and the types of measures that could support maximizing investments. We are pleased to have with us Genevieve Mortimer, Project Manager at Climate Kick Australia, and Professor John Barnett, Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow in the School of Geography at Melbourne University. Please feel free to include your questions and comments in the Q&A featured in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will do, your, do our best to include your comments into the conversation that we're about to embark on. Um, but if we don't get to it all, um, please rest assured we will try to follow up. So let's just um, get right into it. Um, can you, uh, I'm turning now to Tina Taranaki and Yara. Um, global warming, as I mentioned, is accelerating. The imp impacts of climate change are having its earliest and most disproportionate impacts on, on your com communities. Um, in this order, Tina and then Taranaki and then Tiara, um, tell me about what you're seeing on the ground. What, how is it impacting your community and your community responses to, to those impacts? Um, uh, let's start off with you, uh, Tina. I think we've switched around your names between yourself and Taranaki, but we'll, we'll get the order right. Tina, go ahead. Um, well, first of all, hello to everyone and to um, Eugenine um, and to uh, Melbourne University for bringing this um, occasion uh, together and inviting us all to be part of the conversation. Um, it's really a, a real honor to, to be here and to be among others who are working in this area. And it's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see um, both old friends and also some new faces and um, learn uh, from you all. Uh, so again, thank you. Uh, from the Marshall Island side, I think um, I can say in terms of what we've been seeing on the ground, uh, for decades now, but particularly in the last five to 10 years, um, you know, the signs are increasingly challenging, the um, increasingly frequent and intense droughts uh, leading to several declarations of national disasters and emergencies, um, increasing flooding events um, due to sea level rise uh, and inundations, um, both from king tides with no additional weather, but with when you bring in um, additional weather, those king tides can become uh, quite dangerous and scary. Um, and then I think even at the end of last year, in particular, the, the health, the health uh, impacts, uh, we had a sustained and actually it's still ongoing dengue outbreak um, in the latter half of 2019 uh, that was 
and continues to be very challenging in our community. Uh, at one point, our Secretary of Health um, was calling it, uh, calling our ERs and our hospital look like a war zone. Uh, and it was very sort of, I mean, this was pre-COVID, um, but in fact, we were going through that kind of situation uh, before COVID started. And the parallels are quite similar because the dengue is you know, directly related to changes in weather patterns. Um, there, have been, there has been dengue maybe once or twice before, but not this kind of sustained outbreak that we we're seeing now. Um, and, and like COVID, you can relate the, directly to um, you know, humans impact on, on the global environment. So um, those are just some of the, the very difficult challenges that we were seeing um, and we have been seeing for, for many years now. Taranaki, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Janine. Um, I guess I would like to say thank you also for I know you were experiencing some unstable um, uh, connections. So if you wish to to turn your video off, um, that would be fine, Taranaki. Diara, until um, Taranaki can um, reset his, his connection, why don't we go over to you um, to share your perspective in the meantime? Yeah, no problem. Um, thanks, Janine. Uh, so first, I also want to acknowledge and pay respects to the Wurundjeri people who are the custodians of country for where I live in Melbourne and am dialing in from. Um, so, some of you may know, but, but my country is Minjiraba, North Stradbroke Island, and the surrounding Moreton Bay and Redlandshire areas, where my people, the Kwandamook people, have lived and cared for country for at least 22,000 years. <clears throat> so, some keen listeners might realise that this occupation extends back before the immense sea level rise during the last Ice Age period. So, we and many other Aboriginal communities around the country have generational knowledge about adapting to climate change. We have stories from our old people about living on what is now Moreton Bay, what is now the water area or water country. So resilience is a core, I think, to, to Aboriginal experience in Australia from those rapid climate changes um, in the old times to colonial violence, displacing people from homelands, um, and the current impacts of colonial climate change. So on the ground in Minjiraba, but um, it's a similar story to a lot of the country at the moment where much of the focus is on fire management. Um, we have bushfires almost every year now and the rangers are working um, really closely with emergency services in, um, to try and respond to the, the growing threat. Um, so they're trying to link traditional fire management practice with work from the emergency services to, to pocket outbreaks or fire um, fire outbreaks because 80% of the land, uh, uh, the island is um, national park. So Strabrook Island is um, Minjiraba and that's where most of the Kwanamuka people live. So as far as how this relates to national planning, I'm not really sure it does. It's very much an initiative of the community and um, it kind of begs the question, is there any real major efforts being done in Australia to link community-based climate projects or environmental resilience projects with national planning? Um, I don't really see any consideration being given to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when it comes to managing countries, although there have been some moves towards maybe incorporating some traditional fire management into national kind of fire management programs, but it's hard to pull that apart from kind of colonial practice and colonial attitudes um, that govern much of the policy. So I think climate adaptation in, is in a lot of respects a product of, of that kind of structures of colonization or can could be. Um, and while the kind of these indigenous knowledges are being acknowledged now, um, in practice, it's, it's still continuing to be marginalized. So um, I guess as the community struggle to comprehend Im impacts of climate change, um, there's a real focus in our community and, and lots of communities about applying our old ways of knowing to um, this growing threat. 
whether or not that's sea level rise or king tides or erosion, fire, particularly at the moment. So I think there is a real need to facilitate some greater expansion of Indigenous custodianships of country and, and allow communities to implement inv innovative solutions to growing threats of climate change um, in their country. So as an example of what's going on um, with my people, that's that. But, you know, there's lots of evidence elsewhere as well. If you look at the Torres Strait or everywhere about really innovative and interesting projects to try and cope with this kind of next environmental catastrophe. Dara, I'm going to pick up on, on a thread of that um, uh, comment that you made just now, but let me see if um, we have Taranaki um, live now. And, and Taranaki, I know in, in Kiribati, um, you do take a whole of country approach, um, a whole of society of approach in your um, adaptation planning. So um, if you could reflect on, you know, how, um, what are the impacts and the responses that uh, that, that that has generated um, in your national planning processes, um, that would be great. Um, so over to you, and I hope, fingers crossed, your connection is working. Thank you, Jenny, and I think it's better now because I've turned off the video. Um, well, let me just respond um, to the points I think raised by Tina. Climate change is an issue that meets our resilience. Um, I think uh, how I'm framing it, and I think you fit us quite well here, Janine, I think purposely, because you put me in the middle of these two discussions that have been made. Now, where I come in now from Kiribati is in terms of the conceptualization of adaptation um, from our end, uh, much like the points raised by Jara in terms of the utilization of traditional knowledge, I think that has been a uh, core focus in the past few years, uh, including in the past few months in terms of some of the recent resilient um, projects. So from our end in Kiribati, the focus on the adaptation features need to incorporate, and I think this has been missing for some time. Uh, so there's been a shift with this whole of island approach to look into the resilient instincts that have been themselves, um, to not think of them as vulnerable communities, but communities that have lived in these islands and built uh, their lives and their histories on a nature of resilience. And I think that's very important in terms of our policy making now. And we do hold uh, to account some features of um, colonization or colonial precepts that have existed within our policy making that have resulted in, in this conceptualization of, of our national policies not being very well aligned with um, the natural. So I think um, you might find out, and, and this is a realization on our behalf as well, that as you go out to some communities and you talk about them being vulnerable and we lost you, Taranaki. Okay, we get we get the, the, the core message, Taranaki, and we can pull up um, some of those issues that you've raised. Um, I think it's very important um, to, to really reflect on how the international discourse um, has been progressive. Indeed, um, you know, we do speak a lot of the times in, in the negotiating rooms and certainly um, politically we speak of um, uh, climate change being this existential threat. Um, but I guess the question is, you know, what does that trigger in response? Um, if we speak more in terms of resilience, does that change how we respond to, to the, the climate impacts? Um, Jara, I know you have specific interests in, in that um, uh, kind of reorienting the discourse on adaptation to um, in, in a sense, it decolonized the international environmental discourse. You might want to um, address that. Um, and then Tina, I know in a, in a previous discussion we had um, in April, we spoke about the um, concept, or, or, or um, maybe it was Kathy, we spoke about the right of self-determination um, as being critical to the adaptation approach from, from the Republic of Marshall Islands. And, and that is true also um, in the case of Kiribati. So, um, Jara, let me let me go over to you um, to to comment a little bit on this uh, reorienting the international environmental discourse, 
um, what would be um, supportive of this vision of the um, resilience of vulnerable people, um, communities, um, islands, um, and, and um, let's take it from there. Dara? Yeah, it's, it's a hard question, but you know, in my mind, and um, climate change is going to require a, a real renegotiation of how people and the environment or the, that relationship between the people and the person in the place um, is, and th this is going to have to change <clears throat> over time and into the future. So I do think within that, within that renegotiation, there's room for decolonial possibilities that can empower communities, indigenous communities, not just in Australia, but everywhere to um, have greater control and greater custodianship of, of their homelands or their country or um, their nations. Um, so I think within adaptation globally, um, it's at a crossroads. We can, we can go forward and reproduce colonial structures um, in planning processes that have that we we see have been um, reproduced through other development processes like health and justice and and education <clears throat> or or we can um, take a step back and really think about the process and what that can do as um, to introduce some decolonial politics into um, the climate adaptation space so in my mind modern climate change and there's plenty of evidence out there but um, is it's a symptom it's a symptom of colonization if we take the, the imperial expansion into owned and occupied territories in Australia or Africa America was to increase land and increase access to agriculture and increase access to resourcing and mining um, <clears throat> and that there was a change of that environment to suit that expansive mindset um, then we can see that fossil fuels are a part of that story and it's just another chapter in this kind of colonial narrative in Australia where climate change is now impacting us but it's not without um, that kind of story of growth at the expense of the environment in Australia and elsewhere in America um, and that exploitative kind of expansion exploit mindset I think needs to be a real part of the story of climate change particularly in how we associate that back to the kind of efforts of Indigenous communities in Australia, but also um, communities in the Pacific, communities in the Caribbean, South America, America, Canada, um, Asia, <clears throat> Africa, everywhere. That that needs to be a real consideration about and a real point in that narrative, I think. So recently in Australia, we've had some kind of instances, not necessarily climate related, but um, that kind of express that that mindset is still occurring here when it comes to development. Um, and I pay my respects to the Jabwarung birthing trees and the Junkan Gorge sacred sites that um, have been lost to the communities and use them as an example. We, we are preferencing Western orientated kind of development pathways within our colonial system in Australia. And, and it's often at the expense of cultural heritage or the environment or the country. Um, and my big fear is that adaptation is just going to reproduce those in inequities and those kind of structural structural issues in Australia. So I'm hoping on the, uh, also on the flip side with by introducing decolonial practice into the adaptation thinking, there's, there's opportunities for communities to, to get together more, to have dialogues and around these kind of alternative practices between um, outside of that kind of Western norm, um, between Australia and the Pacific or America or Canada or Asia or Africa, um, areas that have been impacted by this type of um, just expansion, this kind of greed and malice mindset yeah. that, that is occurring. So. I'm really yeah. hoping that, that that can kind of come out of this in the future. Yeah, indeed. Um, and, and actually, I think that would be a good way to segue into to Tina um, and, and then Taranaki. You know, there's a lot of effort um, to, to bring forward um, from the community 
um, a, a new focus on you know what exactly are your priorities moving forward within the next um, well immediately as well as within the next decade. Um, so I wonder if you could um, comment you know on on the vision that um, uh, the Republic of Marshall Islands has um, for adaptation and resilience of its um, of its people, um, and and you know take up that thread of discussion around the line of you know really ensuring that that this concept of adaptation as a right of self-determination is, is going to be cemented in, in the responses that you um, bring forward. Um, so Tina, um, over to you. It really helps me to hear uh, from Jara and also Jaranaki. Um, some of the theme, many of the themes are, are shared and I think ex some experience are shared even though we're in um, different places, but that experience of colonialism, certainly, uh, and how that has affected our practice, even the way we view ourselves in the outside world. Um, and in my introduction before, I just wanted, I, I was framing, really looking at sort of the impacts that we've been seeing and the Marshall Islands has been really beating the drum along with other SIDS, but, you know, we've had some really um, amazing um, advocates on the world stage, right? Um, thinking of Tony De Bruyne and um, uh, former President Heine, many, many amazing advocates um, who who have gone out really to to tell the world the the challenges that we're facing and really the crisis that that not just we are facing but the, the world is facing. And um, there was a real a shift, a pivot, uh, a couple of years ago, where we realized, you know, we we've, we've been and that really important work. Um, there needed to be a pivot to really look at how we're going to face this at home. Um, you know, not that that work hadn't been happening, but there had been so much time and effort spent um, in negotiation negotiating rooms um, that we we just realized we we, we can't spend all the time there because we really need to uh, focus in uh, on you know how we're going to face this practically speaking at our in our communities uh, and so it was at that time that um, there was a commitment made to come up with a national adaptation plan and and we actually had meetings together with um, brothers and sisters from the other Atoll nations, including from Kiribati, and found that a lot of folks were actually probably a little further along than we were, um, and we could learn a lot from them. Uh, and we came up with some sort of, at least principles to begin with to guide this work. And um, I'll just bring up two, I mean, many of the things that you've talked about actually, um, but one in particular was self-determination um, and survival. Um, recognizing the, the 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 crisis and the challenge, you know, existential challenge of threat, but also the the need to meet that um, with a very clear view of the challenge, but also a very clear view of of our ability to meet that challenge. Um, like so many people in our region, the Marshes are. We, we are very resilient people. We need to really keep that as, as, a, as a focus. Uh, I mean, pre-colonialism, building a life on an atoll is challenging. Um, there's lots of opportunity. It's, it's, there's a lot of joy, but it's also quite difficult uh, to live on, to, to live in on, on an atoll. Um, but Marshallese not only lived, but they thrived on those atolls and they, they migrated, they sailed, they, they really built uh, a community and a society that is resilient. Um, and that society survived, you know, the onslaughts of many different colonial powers, nuclear testing, um, forced migration, forced exile. That is an experience that we can draw on as we now look to this newest challenge. Um, and we've been putting a lot of our resources over the last two years into a national adaptation plan. Um, 
And as I've said, self-determination and survival are sort of guiding principles of that plan. Um, and we know that in advocating, we, in advocating for self-determination self throughout the adaptation process, we drive adaptation as opposed to allowing adaptation to drive us. And that's very much um, a, a possibility that, that, that we need to be prepared for. And, and I just think about even now before we have this adaptation plan in place, um, we have a lot of projects coming in uh, to address adaptation. For a small country like mine, some of these projects in the multi-millions of dollars, um, some of them with hard engineering options, different options, just being able to meet that kind of um, activity in a way where that the activity is not driving you, but you're driving the activity is it, it, it can be very difficult. Um, and so the way we make our choices about how to adapt um, become extremely important because we know that the future ahead is going to be difficult. There, there will be loss and damage. We've already seen that there is loss and damage. So we know that it's going to be difficult. So how we make the choices, you know, putting the vulnerable um, at the core of our efforts, deciding that we want to have a human rights centered approach, making sure that traditional knowledge is given the same kind of space and platform as science, outside science, um, ensuring that we have an inclusive and consensus approach um, that involves all of our, all the people in our communities. Uh, and then asking, making sure that those communities are continuously part of the process to define what the needs are and what the solutions are. Those process, that process, the process of making those choices um, is as important as, and as the work itself, as the end result. Because it's in making the choices that you build on the resilience that you've had from, you know, 1,000, 2,000 years ago. It's, it's making the choices that, that keeps you resilient so that you're not overwhelmed by, you know, the wave of whatever it is, climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're defining the path um, for the future. And so um, I think that that's what we need to remember. We need to build on the resilience that's seen us through generations. Um, and that resilience is really grounded in very strong community ties, strong family, and a commitment to working together. That's mm -hmm. what's gonna get us through. I mean, ultimately, that's, that's who we are. And that's what we're trying to protect, right? We're trying to survive and protect who we are. Um, and so we need to keep that really at the forefront as we engage in these very complex processes um, around adaptation that will involve big projects and potentially, you know, life-changing decisions of, you know, how we, how we inherit land or um, where people want to be, um, uh, what will be lost, some lands that we, we're going to lose. So, yeah, I, I, I know that I know that um, Taranaki has, um, you know, been he's been writing, um, but now he's actually in the in, in the world of implementing. Um, he has uh, written on on these issues, but um, it, you know, I, I remember very well. Uh, the the line from his president we're not, we're not we're not sinking we're fighting um, Taranaki I would love to have you come back in um, to share some views also on on the priorities and and highlighting some of the implementation challenges that you see ahead before I move over to Genevieve and and Professor Barnett yeah Taranaki um, we've lost you again unfortunately. Um, but you know, I, everyone, I, I'm receiving uh, comments in the chat, and and everyone wants to hear from you. Um, so, do you want to give it one more go? I see you're back on. Yes, let, let me let me let me let me try one more go. Um, this is okay. Great. So, thank you. Um, this is a, a very important conversation. I want to fit in um, because I've been following some of the points that um, uh, Atina and Jara have made. 
Uh, and like you mentioned, I have also done some writing on this. And I think for us as well, similar to the Marshall Islands, it's, it's the, and it would be remiss of me not to point out that this is a new emerging consensus kind of um, policy driven um, approach by our government. And it came at the outset of um, kind of a, a, a change in government. And l let me take this opportunity to kind of um, reel into um, some of the, um, the gaps because there was a change in government um, in Kiribati and then there was an, a perceived kind of absence in climate um, negotiations. And I think it was uh, at some point after our outgoing president, um, who was very open and vocal um, on climate change um, negotiations, when that happened, it was perceived as Kiribati kind of lagging behind in the climate change discourse. But I think as I, as I pointed out in my writing, um, Janine, uh, this, is, this is not well placed because what happened was the government in its uh, frustration, if I may use that word, in terms of what's happening with the climate discourse and in particular because we were getting very little attention and very little mobility at the international level. What happened was we took this down to the ground level. And this is where we kind of looked into the whole of island approach as a premise by which we need to focus on where we really, where it really matters and where there is a lot of space for us to build on the resilience that is inherent in the culture of the people of Kiribati. So the whole of island approach kind of took that approach to say, let's not wait for the world to decide on our fate. Let's move forward to look into where we are really resilient. And then with that realization, we have to reorient our policies to look into options where we have some inherent vulnerabilities. Uh, be it in terms of health, be it in terms of water security, we need to build uh, resilience towards these inherent vulnerabilities uh, so that the community in itself will continue to flourish and community then takes that a bit further in terms of uh, positioning itself um, on where it is at the international stage saying we're not a small island, but then we are uh, in line with the narrative that's perpetuated uh, and agreed at the regional level, we are a group, uh, part of a big blue Pacific continent. So we shouldn't limit ourselves to the small islands that we reside on, but also look into the opportunities offered by the large expanse of ocean that's around us and from where our ancestors have been able to survive in these really um, small islands that have been that has faced resilient issues and challenges across the years. So uh, Jenny, that's where the concept of um, the Kiribati vision for 20 years came in. It came in as, as a, uh, if you may put it, uh, a political declaration by the government of Kiribati that it's not going to go away, that it's going to transform itself, that it's going to look into that is the most, to build up its economy, to build up the, the inherent um, resilience, uh, to, to build up resilience of its people and its communities in areas where they're inherently um, vulnerable because of the geographic um, uh, areas or the, the, the geographic context. And I not be uh, succumbing um, to narratives of climate defeatism. And I think that has kind of, um, push forward our climate change adaptation approach over the past few years. And I think recently uh, in, in collaboration with the, um, the Green Climate Fund uh, and our Green Climate Fund unit, we have um, looked into ways in which we can uh, develop a climate change risk profile, uh, look into the macroeconomic risk assessment of the country, Okay, um, Taranaki, we've, we've lost you there again, but I think, I mean, I think your, your narrative certainly synchronizes well with, with what we're hearing from, from our other colleagues, um, Tina and Jara. Um, it's a very powerful narrative of resilience, of orienting this discourse around adaptation to focus on what can be done 
um, and what should be done and looking at, at what opportunities there are. But we know that one of the bigger challenges um, that we face is always going to be related to finance. Um, a decade ago, uh, developed countries agreed that they would put forward by 2020, 100 billion per year. Um, and that amount still can't yet materialize. Um, there was also in principle a commitment to have a balanced approach between mitigation and adaptation finance. But every single report that has come out now, OECD, Oxfam, and the reports that are being done through the UNF, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, basically shows that adaptation finance is uh, severely underfunded at around 21%. Um, and in, in the same breath, um, there's also evidence that uh, small island developing states get something like 2% of, of any finance flows. So it's really um, a significant challenge that's being faced. And of course, there's a strong pivot towards a private finance um, engage in the financial sector. So now I'm going to bring in Genevieve Mortimer from Climate Kick Australia. Um, you did a project recently looking at how to bridge that finance gap. Um, and everyone's, you know, looking at the, the golden goose of the private sector. But maybe you could um, help us understand really what is the dynamic, what are the paradigms that um, inform that um, approach to the finance sector and, and you know, what might need to be changed? Are we, are we taking the right approach? Yeah, great. Um, first up, I want to acknowledge and pay my respect to traditional owners and ongoing custodians of Australian land. Um, today I'm sitting on Gadigal land. And yeah, thanks for that introduction and those really interesting discussion that, that, um, that we had in the first part of this session. I suppose I'm sitting here and there's like, there's a, there's a familiar rhythm now. You know, this morning we've had this creative kind of identity searching kind of nation building discussions, strategic discussions with leaders grappling with pathways of how you transition to adaptive communities. I think um, the statement from Tina, we drive adaptation, adaptation doesn't drive us. That gave me one of those feelings, you know, where you actually think, oh, that's, that's something, that's a reframing that I need to really think through. Like that's something to, um, I need to learn and think more about. So we've discussed good ideas and then we talk about finance <laughs> and all of a sudden it feels like the discourse is restricted. So the conversation becomes about how much will it cost? Who's going to pay? Who's not paying? Where, what, what are they going to pay for? It actually moves from this engaging, creative, open conversation about how we can enable future generations to thrive um, to one about problem, solving a problem and why it's so hard. And actually, in my most reflective state of mind after running this, uh, after leading the Adaptation Finance Project, which is, was based in, in Australia for the last two years, I actually think the most fundamental insight I've gained from leading this project is that this shift in conversation that happens, the shift in the type of conversations that happen when we talk finance is actually the problem. <laughs> um, and I wanna dig a bit deeper into this because it's perhaps not obvious um, at, at first what I mean by that. So yes, there's this dominant paradigm in finance, what I've called in the report, which was actually released publicly yesterday so anyone can read it now. Um, what I've called in that report, the single asset mindset. So decision, decisions are made through certain criteria that have been established around the interpretation of risk and opportunity of that single project or single intervention level. Now, I know this is a dominant case because that's exactly what we were using to try and find, to try and solve the adaptation finance gap. That was our mindset. So our approach was that to find an adaptation project with a clear business case that would generate commercial returns, that we could then package up a, like a big project or a series of projects into Australia's first adaptation bond. And the logic was that demonstrating that this was possible, that it was possible to get private finance to crowd in, would scale the investment in adaptation and crowd in future private finance. Now, the problem, was after a pretty long time, a couple of years, or at least a year of scanning for these projects, it, it didn't work. 
<laughs> there were no finance ready adaptation projects that, that we found in Australia during the scan phase. The vast majority of projects were designed to access government funding, not private finance. But I think equally importantly, we recognise that coming at it the way that we were, even if we were to find a single project, which is possible, you know, like an esplanade and flood management strategies and you sort of combine things with commercial return to other um, adaptation benefits. Demonstrating that investability of that project doesn't scale adaptation investment worldwide or even region wide or statewide because of the context specific nature of that of those projects. So the question is what's going on here. Um, now, I don't want to take up too much of a time, but I was thinking about a scenario and, and perhaps sharing a, a scenario that perhaps explains what I learned through leading this project. Um, and so if, if you want to interrupt me part way through because we need to bring in other voices, then please do. Um, but otherwise, I'll just sort of say, let's, let's imagine the situation. You're pitching a strategic pathway to transition to an adaptive region. So this is, you know, like what we've talked about today, you know, these holistic, multifaceted interventions that, that actually empower different types of voices to reshape your community so that it's adaptive. So like, like, like some of the real threads and ideas we've heard today, you're pitching that to a group of people who are responsible for deploying capital. Now, the thing is here, there's three different groups, there's three different rooms. You have to go into the first room, then the second room, then the third room. And the concepts are saying, you need to generate some interest in financing your idea. What changes in each room is the mindset of the audience you're talking to. So you walk into the first room, and this is what I've described as a single asset room. So all people in this room view the problem through a single asset lens. So this means they assess the value, as I said, of the business model and ultimately investability of your idea by looking at each project separately. So once you've pitched your idea, what's the verdict in the room? They're not gonna stack up. These probably individual projects that are in a finance view aren't, aren't generating commensurate returns. It's, so it's this single asset mindset that I think is why we came up against these problems in the adaptation finance project of not having projects. And I think it's interesting mentioning this, this, what I heard this morning, this story of growth at the expense of the environment that Jara mentioned. It's that same mindset, I think, that is linked to some of these concepts we talked about today. Okay, all right, so that pitch didn't work, you're moving to the second room. Now in this room, you've got some systems thinkers in this finance, you know, in the capital to deploy. Um, now, they get that the value of adaptation is inherently a function of interconnected multiple intervention points, it's layered, you know, they understand that. Um, they see that you need an investable and non-investable ecosystem to work together to deliver any value of any adaptation projects. So hence they kind of understand it's a bit futile in measuring the value of any individual adaptation project in isolation of another. So this group are more interested in your pitch. Although they don't really think there's going to be big financial returns on it, as like as compelling as they want, they want to talk more and they realize that if they kind of map out a few different things that perhaps it actually becomes cheaper or there's some sort of benefit and there's some, some really good case studies where, where that's been the case around water, often water catchment areas and things like that. So you've got a bit of a path forward, but it's no, you know, slam dunk. All right, next one, we move into this third room. And the third room is filled with people who I'm currently calling the what ifers. And I really think that these people, let's say they think in a similar way to people that we've heard today. Um, they're more interested in the potential strategic synergies or catalytic potential of an idea than talking just about risk management. They're more interested in that opportunity side of the question. So what this means is that this group, this pitch, they're open to talking about the what if questions. You know, like what if we set up our region, our country, our island to be leaders in adaptation? What sort of creative people, experts, and ultimately finance would be attracted if we had this inspiring vision supported by a strategic portfolio of projects, policies, and community interventions? What could the untapped community knowledge, history, and culture be that, that empowers citizens to self-organize? and to achieve bold ideas and to maybe start new businesses, who knows? 
Um, I wonder if it's also linked to Tina's concepts on self-determination and building a, the, the belief and empowering people to meet this challenge. What if you tapped into that, you know? So the conversation in this room becomes about catalyzing a transition, not just paying for it. This questions, like these questions explore, how do we spend millions to catalyze billions to then inspire trillions in some sort of global transition? It's a completely different conversation to the one you had in the first room. So the problem, I think we know, what I'm gonna say is the dominant conversation when we talk about finance is the first room. Um, it's this plan control idea that adaptation can be finance if we just get the inputs right. Um, so alternatively, the last room perhaps opens up some of these really new interesting conversations where finance is part of that open conversation, that conversation about possibility. And the thing is here, what we're talking about is social economic transitions of complex systems. So let's just take that, that's, that's the characteristics of the problem. So which of the rooms is actually matching those characteristics of the problem? So thank you for humoring me on that. I hadn't done that in those three rooms yet, but I was, I was like getting my head against the wall about how to explain my own journey in that project. So I hope that was of some use. That was, that was incredibly helpful, Genevieve. And, I, I, and you know, I think, um, the alignment of the narrative. I mean, first of all, I think the narrative in the climate change discourse at the international level really does have to be re reoriented around um, that message that Tina, Taranaki, and Tiara were basically communicating. You know, um, adaptation. Well, we drive adaptation. Adaptation does not drive us. We are resilient um, uh, uh, people, and we've been resilient for thousands of years. Um, so we need to we need to build on that um, positive attribute that, mm -hmm. that we share and we can share with the world. Um, but the climate finance narrative is is different. Um, if you think about the public finance narrative, it's largely donor driven. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to have to deal with that. Um, and then with private finance, we haven't really scratched the surface of of dealing with that. And I think um, you know what you present here is very interesting. Um, one question that came in was, you know, in other words, uh, a, a single engineering asset won't solve climate additional problems. Um, and I think that's basically where you were driving. Um, I know we're, we're running very tight on the time. Um, we, we, and I do want to um, bring in other views. So if, if you can indulge us just for a couple uh, minutes um, extra, maybe even 15. Um, uh, we could have more of a conversation uh, around some of these issues. And Kunin, I would love to hear um, Taranaki's uh, um, views. If, if, you can, if you can't connect um, by voice, please do um, uh, type it into the, to the chat for us. But I'd like to hear your, your comments on Jen's, um, on, uh, Jen's um, uh, proposition or your project. And just so that you know, the, the link to the report of the project was put into the chat, into the Q&A. Um, so you can access it um, because I think it does really bring out some interesting insights on, on how we might want to look at the um, private finance um, uh, paradigm for, for adaptation. Um, uh, Professor Barnett, you've heard a lot and, I, and you've been working in this area in this space um, for some time. I know you've heard you know, threads of issues of narrative, threads of issues of governance, and, and of course you've heard um, issues related to, in, in, you know, what could be invested into a, a resilience agenda. And I'm not going to use the adaptation word right now, um, uh, but um, could you give us some reflections on, on, on where you think this, this can go? What are some of the, the options that we might want to, to reflect on? And maybe you could even pick up on one or two of the questions that, that came up in the chat. Um, you know, is there, what measures might there be in the research agenda or in, in um, other uh, measures that might be able to support some of this reorientation of thinking, alignment of narratives across not only the negotiating, the policy space, but also the finance space. Um, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jolene. Um, I'm joining you all from the Wurundjeri country here in Brunswick, which um, always was and always will be Indigenous land. Um, I just want to say, I guess, 
first of all, thanks for organising this seminar. It's a really, um, it's great to see such a sophisticated discussion about adaptation. It's great to um, to push to see this thinking being pushed ahead. And I, I just want to say to the audience, um, I think there's no doubt you're looking at the future leaders of thinking about adaptation in this seminar, and it's great to be a part of that and um, a privilege to be part of it. Yeah, so picking up on some of these things, um, I guess I got five things I would like to say, I think would probably, you know, we, we could be thinking about taking this forward. And the first thing I think has been really well covered um, by Jaron, Tina and, and Tiara Naki, which is ideas really do matter. And we really don't have very good ideas about adaptation. And so far, I think, you know, the research community and the popular media has, has really sort of failed to inspire or to create a message of hope for small islands, we, we're always looking at worst case scenarios, um, focusing on, you know, on the catastrophic futures. And, I, and you know, we're dealing with this right now. There's advice that's been given to countries that's focusing on a 0.05% probability outcome of sea level rise, like that's the future they should be thinking of. The most likely outcomes for sea level rise we should be looking at and the most likely outcomes of climate change are things that you can adapt to. And when you recognize the history of the resilience that small island states have shown, um, there's grounds for hope there. And we should be investing in researching and exploring um, hopeful scenarios for adaptation. If we don't believe it can be done, it won't get done. If we believe it is impossible, it will be impossible. So the ideas really, really matter here. We get the futures that we imagine. We have to imagine hopeful futures. And it's very important that we stop looking for vulnerability because whenever we look for vulnerability, we find it and we start looking for solutions and studying those and studying what enables them and building on those and building on that resilience and knowledge that um, Tina and Jara and Tiaranaki talked about. I think it's also really important to recognize that this pessimism comes from what, and Tina alluded to this and, and so did Tiaranaki, you know, what's been a really ad hoc piecemeal a dismal process of adaptation in small island states, which has been a process of outside experts controlling the narrative, trying to do adaptation through discrete ad hoc technical interventions. It's, you know, where the, there's just a scattering of things that happen from time to time, according to what donors are willing to give. And that really weak effort at adaptation from the international community then leads the international community to conclude that adaptation can't work. So they do a bad job and they conclude as a consequence of their own failings, that adaptation is not possible. So I think there's an implementation issue here that's becoming a negative feedback as well as a science issue that's creating negative things. And we need to break both of those things. So on that second thing, I think then, and it's my second point, um, I just think we need an adaptation moonshot here. We need, we need the same sort of idea about how to invest and think about adaptation that is characterized by creativity, that's characterized by ambition, that's seeking to explore novel solutions and technologies and practices, that's engaged with deep partnerships between researchers and implementing agencies and local people and governments, building on that tradition of resilience that people have, asking local people what futures they actually want instead of telling them what futures they're gonna get, asking them what sorts of environmental changes they can and can't live with, what sort of adaptations they think could work, um, what are their tipping points and threshold points and how to avoid those things. This would be a moonshot that maximizes the application of technologies and practices that we see reduce vulnerability in other places. Tiara Naki is in and out, is the director of multilateral affairs for Kiribati and in and out of this conversation because ICT in Kiribati doesn't work very well. So how do you have an exchange of ideas when we can't even fundamentally have decent telecommunications. We know telecommunications are really important in reducing vulnerability. We should be investing in telecommunications. We know that transport systems and shipping systems, aviation systems, connecting rural to urban areas, reduces vulnerability, increases market flows, improves investment in human capital. So there's some basic fundamental technologies we know that exist, we should be investing very heavily in. We know that rainwater harvesting and desalinization can help solve water problems. We know a lot about um, local food practices and also how to create food imports and food subsidies to solve food problems. There are all sorts of innovations in building design here that can enable infrastructure to be more mobile and dynamic in response to changing islands into the future. We stop building concrete houses and concrete slabs and build more portable houses and can be moved around as shorelines and islands move, change shape. Um, 
there's huge scope for nature-based solutions for adaptation that we've barely even begun to think about or pilot and trial. We need to really be in innovating and investing in the kinds of ideas my colleagues at Melbourne Uni are talking about, which is wave attenuating, sediment trapping, pearl oyster beds, for example, that, 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 that have adaptation benefits and livelihood benefits that could deliver multiple returns. Can they work? We have to experiment with these and, and find out. So there's all sorts of technologies that we could be deployed here in a kind of adaptation moonshot that we can harness with good ideas and good partnerships and see where they get us. We need at least to try to see what adaptation can do before we give up on it. The third part of that then I think is to sort of institutionalize that, that idea about you know, hopeful ideas and a moonshot through, through proper investment in networks for adaptation. Um, nodes in each country with a light central governance structure that support individual countries to implement large-scale long-term adaptation programs and plans that can disperse funding, that can provide technical expertise, that can engage in monitoring and learning, that can engage in training um, of new leaders and entrepreneurs, that can build networks of learning and diffusion among islands. So there has, at least in the Pacific, been this idea about a centre for, for adaptation, but this has always sort of been the idea that we'd heavily based in one place. I think we need to move to a network idea where there's heavy nodes in every country that does that with a light coordinating mechanism. So that people like Tina and people like Tiaranaki, you know, are well supported and able to support their countries in country and build up a cohort of people with the capability to drive this agenda. So institutionalize the hope and institutionalize the moonshot. Two other things I think that are really important here to support all this would be regional um, and national level adaptation trust funds. So we, trust funds are uh, one of the sort of unsung successes of development in the Pacific. Lots of countries use trust funds very innovatively. They use some of that financial knowledge and, and that Genevieve is talking about to show how investments can generate returns and you can spend those returns to fuel to fund adaptation. And this would help get past some of the political economy problems of adaptation, which is all very projectified, it's all very donor driven, and it's all very short term rather programmatic. So this idea about a network for adaptation, experimenting, training, pushing through a moonshot, the funding of that could come through returns on investments and adaptation trust funds. The fifth idea here, I think, is one that um, you'll know about, Janine, but is lacking in the Pacific, which is a, which is a regional disaster insurance mechanism, a, a, a cat catastrophe insurance mechanism. The Caribbean has one. Um, for better or for worse, I'd be interested to hear what you think about that one day, Janine. But the Pacific does not have one. Um, it's been talked about, and I see there's people on this chat who could comment on this if we wanted to, for several, several years, it's always going to happen. We're always going to have a disaster insurance mechanism that can help with recovery after events, but it never happens. So I think this is a really important thing to deal with some of the losses and damages that Tina was, was, was working on, reducing dependence on donors for disaster recovery, because that's going to become more problematic in the future, and institutionalizing disaster response through a regional insurance mechanism. So those five things, change the thinking, which I think we've heard a lot about, get creative in a moonshot, institutionalize that through a network of, of adaptation with deep nodes, fund that with, with, with regional and national adaptation trust funds and an insurance mechanism would take us a really, really long way, I think, to getting adaptation happening in small islands. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Professor Barnett, for that. Uh, for those five points, I think really, really well said. Um, I think there are elements of those that have come through in this conversation. I know that there are elements of those that are being discussed, but really bringing it all together um, uh, in, in one way or the other, um, whether it's through, you know, a, a regional push, let's say through the Pacific, a more cross regional push, let's say through the Alliance of Small Island States, which is the, the main negotiating group for, um, for small island development states. But I think beyond that, I mean, you know, this is something that's relevant beyond just um, small island development states. It's, it's something that's relevant to, to vulnerable communities worldwide. Um, and I think it's, it's certainly something that needs to be um, uh, better. Uh, I wouldn't want to say research, but you know, looked into um, further and, and seeing how we might be able to do um, take some of those steps in a more coordinated fashion, as you've met, as, you, as you've mentioned. Um, I I know um, Taranaki um, probably um, lost connection again, unfortunately. But um, you know, 
since we have just this extra five minutes, let me just turn it back to, to the panelists. Um, and, uh, you know, if you would like to make, you know, a final comment um, uh, to close out the session, I want to thank you all for um, extending your time with us. I want to thank also the participants who um, stayed uh, with us uh, for this period of time, this extra period of time. Um, let me give you guys the final word here. Um, uh, let's start off with uh, um, Tina and then I'll go to Jara, Jen, um, uh, Taranaki, if you come back in, great. <laughs> um, but let me, let me um, start off with Tina. You're on mute. It's late here, sorry. Um, I think my main takeaway is that I wish we had more time to talk about it more and that I could hear more from Genevieve about, and I'm so looking forward to reading the paper you're talking about. So much of what you were saying resonates with my whole experience with climate finance thus far. Uh, you didn't use the word, but bankability, that's, that's always, I don't know if that's, that's essentially my single asset mindset word is bankability, walk into a room. As soon as anyone says bankability, you're like, well, we're, we're, we're out of the room, <laughs> we're out of this conversation. Um, but bankability doesn't capture any of the other things that we're talking about. It doesn't capture um, the, I guess, non-finance oriented wealth that, that we're all trying to protect, right? The wealth of heritage, the wealth of culture, the wealth of nations. I mean, literally just what does it mean to the world to lose a nation for this reason? And I think that, that you know, we're here in this adaptation space because um, we refuse to, to just say, well, that, that's, that's, that's the narrative or that's the, the future that we're looking at. Um, we are instead looking at all of the solutions creative um, either outside of the box or completely in our wheelhouse uh, in terms of our inherent resilience, our traditional knowledge, um, bringing all of those things together. And I think that for us, that for me personally, the engagement and adaptation and in the national adaptation planning process for the marshals is that opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to really take um, both what we inherently bring to the table um, to understand what we can learn from outside to come up with uh, the solutions we need that will ensure um, survival and the self-determination that is like that is key to that survival so um, I, I think that if there's an opportunity to do more of these um, webinars that maybe goes a bit to what John was saying about sort of nodes of knowledge just that chance to have the back and forth to understand what folks are doing in other um, places which you know dealing with so many of the same challenges and themes and trying to connect uh, and create that narrative of, of hope that I think we all need to keep going in this work. Because um, as you all know, it can be, it can get to you. <laughs> it can get to you after a while, but um, so occasions like these really, you know, they really help really like bring you back to, you know, why you're doing it, not just why you're doing it, but there is a lot of of hope and opportunity out there. Um, thanks. thanks. Thanks, Tina. Um, Diara? Thanks, Tina, Tarana, Janine. Yeah, um, John and Genevieve. Um, yeah, I've got like maybe two, two, two final points, I think, and it'll help to answer some of the questions that came through very briefly. There's a lot more to it, but um, as far as traditional knowledge goes and the way it interacts with um, with other sciences, I think um, it's important to recognize that it's a knowledge, it's a way of knowing, not necessarily another discipline outside of, you know, that just sits alongside all other disciplines um, under the, our current understanding of academia. 
it is a different way of knowing that takes a different approach to understanding the interaction between environment, yourself, your heart, spirit, culture, law, kinship. Um, but because of that, it's holistic and Western science has a, has a, is a component of that. There's an infinite room for an infinite amount of knowledge in a holistic way of knowing because it is holistic. It's not disciplinary and it doesn't reject other ways of knowing they become part of it. And so I think, um, you'll be, I think it's, it's amazing how much knowledge is out there already, particularly in communities that are already dealing with this stuff. And I think Pacific is a great example of that where there's so many really like to, you know, like Taranaki amazing academics and thinkers that, are, that, are, that have ex direct experience from countries. And that's, it's the same in indigenous communities too. Um, and I just want to it's leave a, a kind of open-ended question. We don't learn from, you know, when we, when we learn a sport or we learn a skill, we learn from someone who has practice in that skill. And we learn from, you know, maybe a sibling who has done something before and they teach us a new skill or a trick or cooking from our parents or whatever. Um, and I think there's an issue or, or some sort of lost um, understanding that the world should be learning from communities that have practice, that have experience, like the Pacific or like Australian Indigenous cultures. There's practical experience being learned about climate change, about how to adapt to it. And it just seems that it's, we've got to flip the wrong way around at the moment. So yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, I just wanted to leave it on that point. I think there's a, <laughs> you know, if that's a takeaway that we can have. Good question. Um, Jen, I'm hoping Taranaki comes back in, <laughs> but Jen, go ahead. Yeah, I suppose um, it's yeah, really interesting because part of that flip that you're talking about is is about how is part partially is how the financial system value like look at value and so then it's also really interesting to see to hear this like all these stories about what is the opportunity of reconnecting with with um you know knowledge in the community reconnecting with um this you know in, indigenous knowledge of you know sixty thousand years of heritage about how to adapt as well as then tailoring that to doing a, a moonshot. So something about actually aiming for something like that combination, that idea, if you get the narrative right, is really exciting. And that is, I suppose, the space where we have to shift the adaptation conversation to and then find the progressive capital who, who get it and see that money, then capital becomes a lead, one of the intervention points to make, to make that, that happen. It's not the tail wagging the dog or whatever other metaphors might be useful here. So, um, yeah, really very great, interesting discussion. So thanks everyone for their views. Yeah, and I, I don't have Taranaki with us. Um, uh, John, do you, any final parting words? This is a conversation that needs to continue. <laughs> uh, no parting words. I think the people before me said great. everything that I was going to say better. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, let me thank you all. I really regret that we had some connectivity problems um, for Taranaki. He's really brilliant. I worked with him as a fellow um, uh, in, in New York um, and he's, he's uh, published already. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Tina, for joining us late. Um, thank you, Dara, Jen, and Professor Barnett. Um, your contributions were very well received. There were uh, a number of questions directed to Tina um, and to some of the other panelists. I really um, apologize to our participants for not getting to everything, um, but I hope you enjoyed and learned uh, from this conversation, which I agree we need to continue. Um, so thank you all and have a, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. More.